his name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, Mark chapter 12, there's a lot of verses in here. So there's a couple things I'm going to kind of paraphrase for us. Um, but what we do is we take a book of the Bible and we'll just go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. The break here is a little interesting. Like I thought that they should have broke the chapter of 11, but then it would have been like a chapter of 60 verses. Um, but the Pharisees came to Jesus in chapter 11, if you remember, and it's starting where all of the Pharisees, the scribes, those that their job during Passion Week is to look at the lambs and to find out if they're pure and spotless, to see if there's any blemish in them. And so now Jesus, the final lamb of God, who's come to take away the sins of the world, they come and they examine him. And they say, is there any blemish in him? Is there anything wrong with him? So the first question was, hey, what about John the Baptist? Is John the Baptist, um, is he from uh, God or is he from, or no, no, he says, where do you get, that's right, sorry. Where do you get your authority? Jesus, you're coming in the temple, you're spanking us, you're turning our, where did your authority come from? And Jesus said, well, what? I'm going to answer your question with a question. What about John the Baptist? They're like, oh, John the Baptist, I don't, uh, we don't know, we don't know. And, uh, and Jesus is like, then I'm not going to tell you either. And so with that context, Jesus says, verse 1, take a look at it. Then he began to speak to them in a parable. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers, and he went into a far country. And at vintage time, he sent a servant into the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And then they took him, they beat him, they sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent another servant, and and at him they threw stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully and treated. And again, he sent another and him he killed and many others beating and some killing some. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him, they killed him, they cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it was marvelous in our eyes. So here Jesus tells stories. That's always a good thing. You always like, you, you know, I just, I keep going theology preaching, like where's the stories, buddy? Come on. And so Jesus was great at that. He told parables, which means to lay something aside, to give you a spiritual truth. He gave you an illustration, no doubt, as he was walking around, he's like, look at all the birdies. And like the birdies are chirping, you know, look at the flowers. And he gives these life lessons. And so he's talking about the vineyard. Now, these religious people would know what Jesus is talking about because this illustration is in Isaiah chapter 5. And so God says, hey, I built this nation. It's like a vineyard. And I came to get the fruit. And there wasn't any fruit. It was wild fruit. And it wasn't good fruit. And so this has been the nation of Israel is what he's talking about. And the context is John the Baptist. He's going to teach more about John the Baptist. And so he's telling these religious leaders that I have sent servants to tell about God constantly. Prophets, right? And so some, you, don't, you reject the prophets. Some, you beat them. Some, you even kill them. And then he's like, but then I'm going to send my son, my only son whom I love. Of course, they'll respect him. And they don't. They kill him. So they would understand uh, this parable, knowing the scriptures and Jesus telling uh, the parable about this. But take a look at verse 6. It says, therefore, still having one son, his beloved. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing because God sent his son knowing that his son was going to be payment for the sins of the world. Payment even for uh, the nation of Israel for those who believe. And so God loves his son and God loves the world. We get that. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal, eternal life. Everlasting word. You know, got some NLTs in here. 
Verse 9. Those are good. I like NLT. I like NLT. Verse 9, it says, therefore, this is kind of a Scooby-Doo verse right here. Or it roll, right? What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come, destroy the vine dressers, and give the vineyard to others. This isn't like a popular thing. God hates sin. Like, the world does not like the fact that we say the word sin, we say the word hell. Um, they just want to know that God loves us. You see, there has to be God's perfect love. We need to set our minds on God's perfect love and be changed. You know, we're led to repentance by God's love. But also, you got to know the extent of God's love by the fact of how sinful we are and how righteous he is. The fact that we have sinned against God. That if there's any time in your life, and if it's right now, that you do not like what the Bible has to say, that you reject the prophets, that you reject scripture, that you reject Jesus, and you reject the fact that we are sinners, and it's the fact that our sin literally killed God. We killed Jesus. And so we need to know that, that our sin offends God, that he will justly send us to hell if we don't accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so that makes the love of God so much greater, is when you know the extent of our sin and God's justice and righteousness and even his wrath that is poured out on his son on our behalf. You see, oh God, you've saved me from so much that your love is so great. It is so vast. It will take all of eternity. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 says, it'll take all of eternity for God to reveal his love and kindness towards us. That's how much he loves us. But you also have to see that we have offended God. And so this nation, Israel, and these religious leaders killed Jesus, are going to kill Jesus in this narrative, but killed Jesus, and they will be punished if they do not accept Jesus Christ. Now, that's what he gets to in verse 10. He says, you've heard it read, um, and he quotes Psalm 118. If you remember from last week, the triumphal entry, they were singing Psalm 118. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It continues, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will be glad and rejoice in him. Maybe some of you guys like, the day, the day, you know. <laughs> Maybe some of you guys are like, wow, what did you just do? Anyways, in that psalm as well, it says the stone that the builders rejected had become the chief cornerstone. See, what happened is as they were building Solomon's temple, they had this funky-looking stone that didn't look like anything else. And they're like, I think they messed up. So they literally threw that stone away uh, in, a, in a hill in the Kinlaron Valley, and they built the temple. And they're like, there's one stone missing, this really awkward shape, and it's the chief cornerstone. It's the centerpiece to bring everything back together. And someone's like, oh, yeah, remember that weird-looking stone? They got it, and they found They're like, oh, we rejected it at first. But now we see it's the perfect fit, just like Jesus. So the, the, Jesus is the Messiah. The Jews don't like Jesus. So they rejected Jesus, and then they built this thing. Like, the, someone's got to fit the bill. Oh, it's Jesus. Even though we didn't like him at first, we know that he's the perfect fit, that he is the Messiah indeed. And that's what happened for so many after Jesus died and rose again. And it says it was the Lord's doing. See, God laid out this whole human history from Genesis to Revelation. God said, this is how it happened. This is what's going to happen. And when they first sinned, when Adam and Eve first sinned, he said, there's going to be a man born of a virgin out of the woman's seed, and he will crush the head of Satan. That's the resurrection, but it will bruise his heel. That is the crucifixion. And so all throughout the Old Testament, there is this narrative of the Messiah and it was the Lord's doing to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sin, to fulfill the law and the prophets, and to come. And when you accept him, then you say, it's marvelous in our sight. Amen? Amen. It's marvelous in our sight, what God has done. And so they say, verse 12, they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. And so here, now they're really going to decide to kill Jesus. Now, this is uh, the first of four tests is the one about what's your authority. The second one is in verse 13. Let's take a look. Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and Herodians to catch him in his words. 
When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true, and you care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? All right, so here they come up. And, of course, they're testing him. And, like, they flatter him. Like, oh, you're such a good teacher. You don't care about anybody. And that actually wasn't fully true. Like, he doesn't care what you think, right? Like, Jesus didn't care about what people thought about him, but he cared for people. He cared about people so much that he was moved with compassion. He's like, man, they're hungry. I'm going to feed them. He cared so much that he would come and die for humanity. That's how much Jesus cares. That's how much God cares. And so they're setting him up. Uh, you know, flattering him, and you don't care, just tell us the truth, what about taxes? And uh, uh, this is so good. So I was talking with my, my boys about this. This is the first time they ever heard this. And so what this would be like is, hey, do you, should we pay taxes? Because right during this time, the Romans are stealing from the Jews with taxes, and they have the, the, the tax collectors and all this, and so there's no extra funds. They're living in poverty. Rome has come over. They've taken over Judea, and so if they pay taxes, then Jesus is going to be like, yeah, you got to just live in poverty, and that's what it is. It is what it is, or if you don't, then there's going to be this, you know, revolt that comes up, and Rome's going to be like, no, listen, we're going to kill you. We're going to crucify you just like we crucify everybody. You're under our rule. And so what does Jesus say? Like, oh, you guys know what he says, but this is amazing. Just pretend like you've heard this. You haven't heard this before. First time. Jesus said, why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it, and he said to them, whose image is inscribed on this? And they said, Caesar. And Jesus answered and said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God, the things that are God's, and they marveled at him. My boys are like, that's like the greatest answer ever. Like, I wasn't thinking about that. I was like, what is he going to say? Is it taxes or no taxes? And he's, uh, Jesus is amazing. He's very smart. So I love the fact that um, Jesus didn't have any money. And that kind of just does away with the whole health, wealth, and prosperity thing right there. Um, Jesus doesn't care about your wealth. He cares about your heart. And so he says here, whose image is inscribed on this? And I'm sure you guys have heard this, right? That um, we're supposed to pay taxes. You guys heard that, right? You should pay your taxes. You live in America. You drive on their roads. You live in uh, the protection of this place. Yeah, you should pay your taxes. You should vote. Amen? Amen. There we go. Okay, that's good. Now, um, where am I going with this? Oh, yeah, the image. So... Because Caesar, you know, he has this money that, um, that he's put out, and you guys are using it. So just like our dollar bill, we have the leaders of our country on that. And so since we use that money, since we live here, we pay taxes. Uh, we give back to what they say because we're Americans. And so that is his image on it. But Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Because his image is on that money, but to God, the things that are God's. This is where it's really cool. Is that, where did God put his image? Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image. So that means, yes, we pay taxes, we use this money, we live in this country. But everybody, no matter where you live, no matter how old you are, you belong to God. You've been, you've been made by God. And how wonderful and beautiful is that? That God made us. That we have a purpose. That he loves us. That he's counted the hairs on our head. That he's made our eyeballs the way. That he's gave us a, a thumbprint. When we think about, do I have any value? Do we have any worth? God made us in his image. He loves us. He cares for us. He knit us in his mother's womb. Or in, in our mother's womb. Um, I thought of this one story as we were worshiping and, um, and just thinking about this passage. And uh, there was these four children uh, who brought their mother uh, breakfast in bed. 
And so from the oldest to the youngest, they, they have this tray of all the food. And, and so you brought the, the coffee. The oldest, like, here's your coffee, special, you know, five creams, seven sugars. And uh, I was like, oh, yes, that's so good. That's tasty. And then the next one, you know, here's your bowl of fruit. It's like, oh, I love the strawberries. Yes, thank you. And here's, here's the plate of pancakes. I was like, oh, man. And then the youngest was just holding the tray. And he's like, man, I don't have anything. And so he dropped the tray. And he jumped on the tray and he said, Mom, I give you me, right? And so, you know, when we say, hey, we're supposed to give of our finances, time, talent, treasure, what God desires more than anything, here, Lord, I give you me. You're made in God's image. He wants your heart. He wants your life. He's not after your money. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your talent. He made you. He wants your heart. He wants your love. And so we give our lives to Jesus because we're made in his image. Amen. So they marveled. And even my sons hearing that for the first time, they're like, Jesus is so awesome. Okay. So here's the third one. This one's a, this one's a fun one. Okay. Verse 18. Verse 18. Then some of the Sadducees who say there's no resurrection came to him and they asked him saying, teacher, Moses wrote to us, if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took his wife and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her and he died and uh, he did, nor did he leave any offspring. And the third likewise, so the seventh had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection... When they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. What was this woman cooking, right? All these brothers are dying. You know what? I don't want to be married to any of you. I'm just, you're all dead, right? It's a rhetorical question. The Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And so they came to Jesus and they said, hey, the resurrection, here's one for you, Jesus. There's this gal, she gets married to the oldest, and it just goes down and down and down until she has no kids. You know, who's going to be married in heaven to her? And uh, yeah, you got to think that stop putting whatever you're putting in the eggs, lady. Um, Jesus answered and said to them, are you therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? And so here, the Sadducees believed in the first five books of uh, the Old Testament, the Torah, the Pentateuch, but they didn't believe in any of the prophets, in any of the narrative. And so they rejected anything spiritual, any uh, resurrection, any miracle, anything like that. They would be, you know, you have the Pharisees who would be like the super conservative, right-wing, crazy, uh, political, like, hey, wait, what, what? Yeah, sorry, I'm just going to offend everybody. And then you have the Sadducees who would be on the left, liberal, you can believe whatever you want to do and do whatever you do as long as you're sincere. Uh, so maybe you're all offended. There you go. Jesus can fix all of that. And um, he says, you do not know the scriptures, nor the power of God. And so what we want to do is come to the word of God and say, God is able. You know, even thinking about Abraham, it says in um, Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham was going to kill Isaac there because he knew that God could rise him from the dead. And so there's always been this, we believe in a big God. We're small people and we believe in a big God who can do mighty things. And we read the narrative of the scripture and we say the same God that freed um, Israel from Egypt lives inside of me. The same God that took down the Goliath through David lives inside of me. And so we believe in the scriptures, amen? And we believe in the power of God, amen? amen. Is that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And so we don't want to come trying to trick God or say, you know what, I'm going to believe whatever I want to believe about the Bible. No, we need to take the whole of scripture and believe that God is alive. And that's what he says. Now here's a very interesting verse, and I'll do my best. Uh, but it says, for when they rise from the dead, they will neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels. Okay, so with all the commentaries that I've read, they're talking about who is this lady going to be married to, and Jesus is saying, we don't need to be married in heaven. 
I'll go on just a little bit more. Okay, so we don't need to have kids so there won't be sex in heaven. And also, we will be fully satisfied. You see, here God gave us an incentive um, to make kids, and he gave us sex within marriage. But in heaven, we are, in a sense, married to God. That's the, that's the Bible language. And so it says that in God's presence, there's fullness of joy. And at his right hands, pleasure forevermore. And so when we're thinking, what's the most pleasure we can get here on earth? Are we going to experience that in heaven? Well, like, we're not even going to be thinking about that. The, ex the experiences that we're going to have in heaven are going to blow our minds. We have to get new bodies to experience the joy and pleasure that God has created for us in heaven. All right? So, like, go get married now, right? Whatever. Verse 26, but concerning the dead, they rise... Uh, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. So he answers the third question first about John the Baptist, second about taxes and hear about the resurrection and he just slays it, right? And it's like, God, oh, man, Jesus, you're so smart, man. But he brings up this fact that God is alive. That when you die, you rise again. That when you die, if you believe in Jesus, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Amen? That we go straight to heaven. Now there is a resurrection, a physical resurrection of our body. If you believe in Jesus Christ, then you will stand before God on what's called the Bema Seat Judgment. And that's a good thing. All the things are burnt away, that anything that we did bad. You, Samson. Right? Samson is in the hall of faith. How did that happen? Put faith in God. All the, everything, his whole life, he just had his last moment. Faith in God, right? So if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will go to heaven. You confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart, you shall be saved. All the sin you've committed will be burnt away, and anything that you do for Jesus will last for all of eternity, and then we return that back to God in praise. But if you do not believe in Jesus, there will be a resurrection of the dead. And you'll stand before Jesus Christ in a great white throne judgment. And every single thing you thought, you did, your motive, you said, will be judged before everybody and before God. And he will justly send those people that do not believe in Jesus to hell. Just like what we deserve. But we passed by by believing in Jesus and his final payment for our sin. And so we believe in a God who is alive and that we will one day be resurrected with new bodies. However, the whole thing works. We don't think we have got enough time, but when you die, you're in the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. That's good. Okay. Fourth question that they bring to him. Verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? For Jesus, before we get into his answer, which is probably like all of our favorite passages of scripture. If you're not familiar with it, it's going to become your favorite. Um, just imagine what's happening right now. You have, you know, Jerusalem is overfilled with people from all over the world there to celebrate the Passover. Jesus is, like, <laughs> no one has ever been like Jesus. They're all hearing about the miracles. Maybe they've experienced miracles. Maybe they got fed by him. They're seeing the rush that's coming up to him, and they know this guy is different. And all the religious guys are like, we want to kill him. But then you have this scribe. Now, the scribe's job is to literally write down the Bible. And even like, you know, when you would write down Yahweh, the name of God, every time you'd have to write a letter, then you'd have to go and do a cleansing process and then come back, do another letter, and then do a cleansing process. And so no doubt this scribe, we don't know how old he is, but he's written out the Bible lots of times. And he's probably memorized the Bible. And so here he's like, this guy's answering. These are good, these are good questions, and he has given some good answers. What is the Bible all about, Jesus? What's the greatest of all the commandments? There's 613 commandments. And the Pharisees took those 613 commandments and they just multiplied that by a thousand. And so now there's all of these ways to keep the Bible. And he's just like, what is the one? 
What is the one thing? What is the Bible? What is it, what is it, what is it all about? Verse 29. This is what life is about. The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. We love this. We love that God came down because of his love for us. And then he summed up the entire Bible with love. I don't know about you, but like that, that checks out with my experience in life as I was a teenager um, looking for love and uh, doing these things to become spiritual. And I remember one moment where it was probably my darkest night ever. And Jesus came in and he loved me. And I realized, I was literally like, you know, looking, wanting to follow somebody that's spiritual. And I'm studying Confucius, Muhammad, Buddha, you know, reading all these books. And not Jesus, right? I'm like, no, my parents did the Jesus thing. I'm doing something else. And then I'm, I'm literally like thinking about all these people. And I, I read their history of who they were and what they said. And I'm like, who's the most loving? Dang it. It's Jesus. And I became a Jesus pursuer. And then his love overcame me. And the greatest thing is that God loved us first. Is that it doesn't initiate with us. Oh, God, please love me. Oh, God, I'm here to love you. I'm here. No, it's like God is... Waiting. It's like the Jesus telling us of his love and forgiveness through the prodigal son. And when we walk away from him, it's just one step back and he was already running towards us, pursuing us, loving us. And so our natural response back to him is for us to love him back. What does that look like? Well, Jesus said to love him. Well, first he says the Shema. So this is in Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is literally something that the Jews would say all the time. Uh, Shema means here in, in uh, Hebrew. And if you ever go to your Jewish friend's house and there's like this little wooden plaque right by the door, uh, it's called a mezuzah, that has the greatest commandment in it. And they're supposed to like, you know, Shema and say the thing, like give it a little kiss. Um, I don't know if you guys grew up with that. I'm thinking about putting that at our house. No, I'm not. Um, but he says, Shema, you know, you shall love the Lord with all of your heart. With the way that God, you know, we give, the heart means the seat of affection. We give God our affections. Um, now, there's this push um, because we can become emotional and base our Christianity off emotion. God made emotion. Amen. God made our heart. He made our personality. He made our emotion. And so we get to love him back with our heart. Then he says your soul. Now your soul is dead until you become a Christian. That you're spiritually blind. Your soul is not saved until you say, Jesus, you're the Christ. You died for my sin. You rose again. Then your soul, the spiritual part of you, when you look at a mountain, you say, man, that's bigger than me. When you look at a sunset, you say, that is amazing. Now your soul's saved and you know the creator. I don't know, do you guys remember when you first got saved and you started looking at flowers, right? Flowers, man, it's like, Kevin's tripping again. No, like, look at this thing. It's, it smells so good. Oh, God, so good. You know, just like all the time. Like I'd never, I, I played uh, football games with a broken ankle. Just like I'd never cried ever my whole life. Just like, Argh! my big brother just like beat me up. Like that was a game. And my house was try to make Kevin cry. And so my big brother and all of his friends couldn't do it. I become a Christian. And I see a sunset, oh, no, Jesus, no, I can't do it, I can't, oh, that's so good. You know, just he like breaks me. My soul got saved. You don't only want to love the Lord with your emotion, you want to love the Lord with your mind. And that's what we're here to do, amen? We're here to open up the word of God. The first thing, you don't come to God and know that God died for your sins on a cross and rose again by looking at a sunset. We come to God first knowing our mind Acknowledging that Jesus is the Messiah. 
that he created everything, and that he died on the cross and he rose again, and we continue to love him with our mind, studying scripture, and then our strength as we serve him. And he says this second is like it. If you actually love God and you are just overwhelmed with his love, you will love people. You'll love your neighbor as yourself. And so verse 32, the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken truth. There is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, understanding, soul, strength, and to love one's neighbor as yourself is more than the whole burnt offering and sacrifice. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Amen, right? <laughs> that doesn't mean that I'm done. I still have five, like five minutes left. Like, oh. Um, George Whitfield, that's right. In the pre-recorded service, I got this all wrong. Um, there was three guys that started the Methodist Church, and this is during the First Great Awakening. So you have the Wesley Brothers and then George Whitfield. And George Whitfield, they went to, I believe, Oxford. They studied in seminary. He moved to Georgia here in, uh, in the South to minister as a missionary to uh, indigenous Indians. He became so sick that he had to move back. I mean, he preached, he gave his life, but he did it all out of religion. He did not have a love relationship. And he one day just opened up his Bible and it just opened up to Mark chapter 12, verse 34. And he read this and it terrified him. And he says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And everything changed from that moment on. In fact, he became possibly the greatest, in, you know, behind the Apostle Paul for how much work he did. Uh, he would preach uh, I think he preached 20,000 sermons. He would travel all around the United States preaching, but he did it out of love. Um, and that's what we need. You see, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship with our maker. I mean, that's, that's the wonderful thing, is that if God calls us to do something, the first thing that he calls us to do is to love him. Right, And then all of the things that we do for other people, that we do for each other, flows out of love for him. And so if you're doing something, let's say this right now, even giving financially, and you're not giving joyfully, like, Lord, like, I just love you, right? I just want to serve you. I want to give you my time, talent, and treasure. If it's not out of love, don't do it. Fall more in love with Jesus. In fact, if it's just a religion to you, like George Whitfield, you are not far from the kingdom of God, this is what it takes. Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of my sin. I've, si I've become religious in how I've done Christianity. I've put on, uh, it's so ironic, I've put on a mask. I've been a hypocrite. And I want people to like me in what I do instead of I want this love relationship. And so that's what happens. We come to the foot of the cross saying, I want a love relationship with my maker. I, you died for my sins. You rose again. I want to spend eternity with you in heaven. And then out of there flows all ministry. And just continuing and, and trying to finish this thing up. Verse 35 and 30 to 37, Jesus talks about how he is the Messiah. You can check that out. Uh, 38 uh, through 40. Um, I'll, I'll read it, but it's just talking about not being religious. Here we go. He said to them uh, in his teaching, Beware of scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplace, best seats in the synagogue, best places at the feast, who devour widows' houses for pretense, make long prayers. They will receive a greater condemnation. You see, when you're religious, it's even worse than just living apart from God. In Romans chapter 2, so Romans chapter 1 talks about, you know, if you want to have sin and you want to do whatever you want, God's going to let you do it. And you're going to see all around you that there's a maker and he's going to convict you of sin. Romans chapter 2 talks about those that know the scriptures. And they even teach the scriptures, but they don't do the scriptures. There's a greater condemnation for them. And every time you sin, you're actually stacking a judgment according 
to when you stand before God. And that's why this is like a frightening thing is that you need to get right with your maker and not become religious, but come into a relationship. Final thing here, Jesus says, verse 41, talking about giving. Now Jesus sat opposite of the treasury and sat and saw how the people put money in the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites which makes a quandrous. So he called his disciples to him and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they have put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had her whole livelihood. I kind of find this narrative kind of funny too. Jesus goes to the temple and there's the giving box And he's just like, chilling, looking at everybody give. Like, that'd be super awkward if I went out there and just, like, looked at you guys. Like, are you going to give this week? You know? I'm not going to do that. In fact, that's really bad. Uh, I don't know what you guys give, and I don't care. Um, So don't come to me like, oh, good sermon, Pastor. You know, like, I don't know. There's boxes around here if you want to give. I I don't care. That actually happened one time when I first came here. Uh, Some guy, you know, heard that we planted a church and uh, he came down to the hill, went to the basement. I think he even fell asleep during the sermon. And then he like, you know, come like, oh, yeah, good pastor, good, good sermon pastor, and put like money in my pocket. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. And like I took it out as like a $10. I was like, it's a $10 sermon, okay. Wasn't $20 sermon? Wasn't it? All right, I'll, hey, I get dinner now. So Jesus is looking at what people give. And I think that's proper is that we should know. It's not, it's not for us to know. It says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. But Jesus knows. And so you have these two different people. And honestly, what was happening here is these religious people, these people of wealth, would go over and they would get change. They want to get the medal so you can hear all the you know, clinking. And then if you weren't paying attention, they'd have a little bugle and they go, deep, 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 everybody I'm giving, look at all the stuff that I'm giving, right? That's literally what happened, blowing his own horn. And then you have a widow making sure that nobody's looking and all she has is a penny, two mites. And she puts it in. God, I love you. And I know you're going to take care of me. And Jesus, God says, it's not the amount, it's the heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. So as we are here to serve, when we believed in Jesus, he didn't just take us to heaven. He gave us something to do. And one way that we really can serve people is giving financially. And so you need to allow God to uh, show you what that means. And it doesn't, it's, God's not putting a, a number for you. That's how spiritual you are. It's your life. Like he said, give unto Caesar what's Caesar's, but give unto God what's God's. To stand on the plate and say, God, I'm here. Use me, take me, I'm yours. Father, thank you that you...